Thank you. Good morning. We thought we'd kick off our morning sessions um, by giving you an idea of how NearMap actually capture our surveys and just what it takes to do it. There's a range of things that have to come together in order for it to all work out and for it to happen. And it makes for a pretty interesting story. As Rob pointed out, NearMap is not and never has been a satellite imagery company. We fly planes. We do so so that we can provide maps that are a higher resolution for our customers. Um, if you only take one thing away from today, that's what it's going to be. We fly planes. Mind you, the guys coming up later on are going to talk about some really cool stuff. They'll probably want you to take away a little more, but right now, this bit's all about me. Uh, across our fleet, we have several different kinds of aircraft. We have things like Cessna 210s, Cessna 310s. At the moment, we have a, um, a P-68, um, a Vulcan Air P-68. And in the States, we have things like Piper Navajo and the Navajo Chieftains. This morning, we'll have a look at the humble Cessna 210. It is a good, steady, reliable aircraft. They're an absolute workhorse. Some of them have been around for years. And in fact, you can kind of think of them as like your Nana's old Kingswood of the sky, right down to the woolen seat covers and box of tissues on the back. We fly between 8,000 and 18,000 feet. Um, and just for your perspective, if you think about a uh, cruising altitude of a uh, jumbo, is around 30 to 35,000 feet. It helps if you think about what you can see out of the window at those kinds of heights. Gives you an idea of what we're dealing with. Shows how, you know, we're really quite impressive. Say that a little bit humbly, but not too humbly. The height we fly is dictated in the first instance by the camera system we have on board. The higher we fly, the longer the lenses we use. Flying at these kinds of heights allows NearMap to capture in the scale that we do. Globally, for financial year 2019, we will have captured almost two and a half million square kilometres. You can think about that as being capturing almost all of Kazakhstan. No? And if that doesn't particularly be all that relevant to you, I don't know why. You can also think about of being capturing all of the UK, Western Europe and Chile combined. One of the great and unique things about NearMap is that we basically have designed and manufactured and own the whole process from end to end. That includes the design and manufacture of our hardware, the camera systems. We have created our own bespoke software that does most of the processing. We design the coverage strategy, we do the capturing, we create the flight plans, we own the processing and we own the delivery. I just mentioned the flight plans. These are what we uh, provide for our pilots so they know where to survey and what line they need to follow. It's all GPS tracked uh, and based. They also include terrain and altitude data. And our accompanying software dictates when our cameras fire, taking thousands and thousands of survey, uh, photos per survey. We fly in a serpentine action, just back and forth, back and forth. And in fact, one of my favorite stories comes from this, uh, from the States, where we have to have a secret service agent in the aircraft sometimes when we're flying over areas like the White House to make sure we're up to, uh, you know, we're up to no good. The, uh, these guys take about half an hour of this kind of flying before they turn green and lose their lunch. So they're not quite as tough as Bruce Willis would have you believe. That's what we've learned. On average, a single flight will last around four hours. And as I mentioned earlier, we take a lot of photos, a lot. Over our 10-year history, we would have captured over 500 million photos. If, for some weird reason, we would print them all out, stack them on top of each other, that would be four times higher than Mount Everest. Now, when this stat was thrown at me, I didn't believe it, so I've checked the maths on it a couple of times. It's true. It's insane, but it's true. And what's more insane is, next year, we will again take another 500 million photos. One year. How's that for growth? I have a flair for the dramatic. Of course, it's not as easy as all just getting up there, taking some nice photos, making it all look good. 
There's a range of challenges that we face in getting this done. And when I say we, I mean me. We need clear skies, plain and simple. No cloud, no fog, no smoke. It all makes sense. If at altitude you can't see through it, our cameras can't focus on any features on the ground, and we can't capture. So we need clear skies. I'm actually always weather watching for survey opportunities. Um, I can tell you tomorrow in the Gold Coast, it's going to be about 25 degrees, patchy clouds. We won't have a chance. My friends actually use me as their weather app. I'm still as uh, unreliable as the forecasts, of course, but at least I can tell them with a smile that it's probably going to rain on their wedding day. <laughs> and perhaps it's just me, but I get a little evil satisfaction in something like that. Of course, weather is a daily consideration. We have to think about seasonal climates as well. We're not going to try and capture cans in the middle of the wet season. We would struggle to get Melbourne done in the middle of winter. There's certain times of the year that an area's geographical and latitude location that makes it harder to capture or even impossible. The sun's shining down, everything's beautiful. We go up to, say, 14,000 feet, and it's as damn bumpy as a roller coaster. Turbulence, wind at altitude. These are the sneaky, invisible, natural enemies to people in the survey business. They ruin clear days. You saw earlier the flight plan the, that we need to follow. Our pilots have to stay exactly online for all that time. If any chance we get they go offline, we're missing photos that we need. They need to follow the GPS heading directly, and they need to compensate for roll, pitch, and yaw. An aircraft can be moved around in three different directions on its axis. So again, they've really got to stay on our line. Our fly boys and girls, they're incredible, and they have to be. In fact, some of them um, use surveying as building up their hours for, to apply for commercial airlines. And it's surprising how many times they actually come back. When they go there, they're not using the same kind of skill. They're using autopilot. They get bored, and they come back. Another constraint to consider is sun angle. We only capture when the sun is above 30 degrees in the sky. Otherwise, the shadows start getting too long. During the year, what we call available sunlight changes again on the um, season and the latitude of a particular area. Picture it in your own mind. In summer, the sun is right above us. We get good long days. As we move towards winter, it goes lower in the north sky. The hours we have to capture decreases. You can think of Tasmania. There's several months in the year that the sun doesn't even get above 30 degrees in Tasmania. So there's a reason why they can be a little pastier down there. I apologise to any of the Tasmanians in the room, but you know it's true. All right. So finally, now we have a beautiful clear day, the sun angle is perfect, there's no cloud, there's no smoke, there's no fog. Sun angle is great. There's only one thing in our way now. ATC, air traffic control. Now, these guys are incredible, and they have an incredibly difficult job. I've had the pleasure of sitting with them while they work, and I have to say, my inner eight-year-old was over the moon. It was so exciting. But we are at their mercy. If we want to fly in controlled airspace, we need their clearance. Sometimes getting clearance and wanting more clearance can kind of feel like that little orphan kid that has to go up to the powers that be with a bowl going, please, sir, I want some more. It's a bit dramatic again, but the theory's good. Different locations around Australia and around the world have different restrictions in regards to their airspace. We have to consider where our survey regions are and what uh, area or what airspace we will be flying in. For example, over a major airport, we might have to fly quite high. But around the sides, under the approach and departure vectors, we might have to fly quite low. Knowing these kinds of restrictions means we have the right camera system and the right aircraft combination in play so that we can capture and so that we can do so in a manner that keeps our maps of a certain standard. 
Okay, so we're getting towards the end of the capture story now. It's sad, I know. A little bit of a prop. If all our uncontrollable and slightly unruly ducks line up in a row, we look to fly where and when we can 364 days a year. It's only Christmas that we have down tools. We go up there, we capture some incredible things. This earth is stunning and breathtaking, and it has been an absolute privilege to see so much of it in this way like we do. So we're up there, we take our nice photos, they go on card sets or on solid state drives, like this one. This bad boy is a two terabyte solid state drive, and on an average flight, we can fill up five of them. They come back to our office, and we hand them over to the processing nerds. I mean, gods. <laughs> Thank you. Over to you, John. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mashenda. Good morning, everybody. So on these disk drives is all the photos that we capture during the flight. And there are a few other things on there as well, so there's GPS logs and so forth. But fundamentally, everything that we produce comes from these photographs. And actually, that's the way that mapping's been done for over 100 years. So almost as long as we've been flying aeroplanes, we've been capturing photos from those planes and turning those into maps. When I started in this game around about 25 years ago, we were using machines much like the one that's about to come up. They're incredible machines. They are fully mechanical. You operate them by turning dials and operating nod, uh, knobs. It's a bit like being inside a transformer, in fact. Is there anyone in the audience who's actually used one of these machines before? A few hands. Oh, that's fantastic. We don't normally get too many people who've seen these before. But they are incredible machines, and they can produce amazing maps, such as this one in the centre here. This is one of my favourite. It comes from a TASMAP series of maps. There are several hundred of these that make up the state of Tasmania. I am the pasty Tasmanian, I'm afraid. <laughs> and these maps uh, came out about once every few months, and that's how long it would take to create one of those. It was painstaking work, but the results of them were quite amazing. So every one of these maps would get printed onto paper, and then it would get sold in an actual real shop. And there'd be a certain amount of anticipation that came along with each one of these maps coming out. I remember each one sort of going, yes, here's another discovery to be made. This particular map behind me is a small part of my favourite one ever. Uh, and it took me a long time going, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And when it did, it was very exciting. The maps that we produce today at Near Map look very, very different to that. So the contours have gone, and instead now we've got pixels. The intricate line work's no longer there. Instead, now we can see the individual rocks and the individual boulders themselves. The boundary lines, they're not there anymore. Instead, you can see the fence that forms the boundary or the rock wall. The property parcels, they've been replaced by actually seeing the building itself. So the house, maybe the solar panels on top, the garden with the swimming pool, the Kingswood in the driveway. The roads themselves, instead of just being a straight line, now you can see the cars on the road, you can see the lanes, you can see the lane markings, you can see the traffic lights, you can see the road signs, you can see the pedestrian ways, you can sometimes see the pedestrians themselves. So the detail in the, in the maps that we produce is far away, far beyond those maps of old. And the other thing that's changed is that the time taken to make them has come down dramatically. So Near Map today creates an average of 20 of those old maps every single day. Okay. But make no mistake, they are still maps. So every image has its identity and every pixel has its place in these images. They're photo maps. Getting those pixels into those places is hard work. So photos are flat, and the world really isn't flat. In fact, the closer you look at the world, the less flat it becomes. 
And so the only way that we have of turning those flat photos into the fully three-dimensional world that we see around us is to combine multiple photos from different angles. And when you do this, what you can do is a process of triangulation, and that gives you the precise feature on the ground, the precise location of a feature on the ground. And if you do this over and over again for every corner and every edge in every photo, we've got all the information we need in order to precisely locate every one of those photos. Now, if we go further and we do that same process for every single pixel in every single photo that we take, we can end up with a full three-dimensional reconstruction of the whole world. And of course, that is what we did, and that's what we'll be talking about a little bit later on, but not just yet. There's a bit more to get through, because like everything in life, it's never that straightforward. It turns out that light doesn't actually travel in nice straight lines after all. Let me take you through it. So the light that comes into our camera systems comes all the way from the sun, of course. It travels across 150 million kilometres before it gets here. It takes that light about eight and a half minutes to travel across space. And when it gets here, it hits something. It could be the ground, it could be this building up here. It's going to hit something, and it's then going to scatter in all directions. And that scattering is actually a really good thing for us. Because what it means is that no matter which direction we look at that object from, we see the same light, it looks the same colour. And that's what we need for matching up photos from different angles. But some surfaces aren't like that. Some surfaces, such as glass or water, the photons, instead of scattering in all directions, all reflect off in the same direction. And for those surfaces, the angle at which you look at them determines what you see. And if they look different from different directions, it means we can't triangulate, and then we can't find the location. So it's a problem. As the light bounces off and heads up through the sky towards our aeroplane, there's more problems. And this time, it's the air itself that's the, the problem. So if you've ever looked out the window of an aeroplane while you've been in flight, looked down towards the ground, you know that it's really blue and hazy. And in actual fact, the ground looks quite dull. That blue haze is the reflected light from the sun bouncing off the, uh, the moisture and the dust in the atmosphere itself and coming back towards your eye. It's unwanted light. We, it just gets in the way of the imagery. And worse still, it actually stops the light that we do want coming from the ground getting up to our camera system. As the light gets further and further up into the atmosphere, the air actually gets thinner. So at the altitude that we're flying, we're up really in the mountaineering territory. I mean, there are mountain goats wa wandering past our aeroplanes. So the air gets thinner, and as the density changes, and you combine that with the curvature of the Earth, it actually turns the entire atmosphere into one giant lens. And lenses bend light. So it's not quite as severe as what we're showing up on the screen here. It is a fairly subtle effect, but it's something that we have to take into account. And another thing that bends the light as it comes up through the air is atmospheric turbulence. If you've looked out through the shimmer of a heat haze on a hot day over a hot bitumen, for example, that shimmer viewed through several kilometres of air is actually the equivalent of several pixels worth of distortion. As these brave photons finally get to our aeroplane, they have to go through a maze of mirrors and lenses. Now, some of the elements in this, in this system are in constant motion. So whether it's the scanning left and right, up and down of the mirror system, or whether it's just the gentle hum induced from the engines, those photons are getting knocked about by this movement. The final step of the journey for these photons is to go through the lenses themselves. Now, these lenses, of course, are really good quality ones. Um, we use a lot of lenses. But no matter how much money you spend on a lens, no matter how good the quality of the optics are, there are always distortions. It's just the nature of the beast. And you have to model these distortions. And the bad thing about it is that at the altitudes we fly, it gets really cold up there. So it's typically around about 20 degrees colder at altitude than it is on the ground. 
but it can actually also be quite warm as well. So the temperature can go up and down during the flight quite a lot. And as the temperature goes up and down, the elements in the lens expand and contract with the temperature, and it changes the optical arrangement of the lens. And that has to be modelled as well in order to get the accuracy we need. The very final hurdle for our brave near-map photons is the sensor itself. And on that sensor, we place some colour filters. Uh, most importantly, of course, are the red, the green and the blue that are on the, the sensor itself. You may not know this, but humans actually perceive the world differently from one another. So, for example, one in 12 males is red-green colour blind. Fortunately, our sensors aren't red-green colour blind, but they do see the world differently to how humans see it. They actually see more light than, than what we see. They're a little bit more like... Um, like uh, there's an animal that sees more light. Anyone know what it is? A mantis shrimp? A goldfish. Thank you. <laughs> mantis shrimp. I'll look that one up. So we see more light, uh, so we have to take that into consideration. So there's a lot that goes on before it even gets to our senses. Um, fortunately for everybody here in the room, we've got over 10 years of experience in this stuff. And so we've got a lot of software and hardware experience that we can bring to bear on all of these problems. And what it means is by the time the imagery actually gets to the web server and to the website that you guys look at, some of it can be really quite stunning. These are some of my favourites. I've been working at NearMap for quite a few years, and I have to tell you that the, one of the best things about this job is just looking at the imagery. There's an awful lot of it, and it's really good stuff. But one of the surprising things that comes up and surprised me year after year is the fact that you can see an awful lot more from the sky than you can when you're actually there in person. So this is an example of that. This is Manly Wharf. I've been walking over this patch of ground hundreds and hundreds of times on my way to and from work. And I never noticed that if you look at those radial lines coming out from the centre sculpture in the middle there, and they connect up with these big sweeping curves, the whole thing is actually a giant shell. And you don't notice that when you're on the ground. So these curved lines actually end up going all the way across the road, all the way to the other side of the intersection, in fact and you just don't notice it until you're there. So near-map imagery is often actually better than being there in person on the ground. Mishenda, do you want to come out again? So Mishenda's probably seen more near-map imagery than just about anybody in the world. What are some of your favourites? Uh, yes, well, the first thing I always do is check my own house. Everybody, Everybody checks does. their own house. Um, I have a sneaky look at my neighbour's yard as well. But what I've really been looking at most recently is the development of Star Wars land at Disneyland uh, over the last couple of months. So they've knocked up a uh, Millennium Falcon out the back. Uh, it's just finished, uh, just open as well from what I hear. Uh, it's been spectacular. It's been really great to watch. Yeah. Um, and another one we found, uh, we stumbled across, was a nice big uh, marriage proposal. Uh, I found out the hard way. It wasn't for me. Um, but, yeah, it's just something that's, you know, really sweet that uh, we, 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 we like. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you have a great day.